Live from the heartland and the crossroads of America, it's Tony Katz today. The high number of migrants we have encountered at our southern border is a challenge that is not unique to the United States. Countries throughout our hemisphere, in fact, throughout the world, are experiencing an unprecedented number of displaced people fleeing poverty, authoritarian regimes, homes destroyed by extreme weather events, corruption, and violence. The regional challenges require regional solutions, and that is why Secretary of State Blinken and I, with the White House Homeland Security Advisor Sherwood Randall, were in Mexico two weeks ago, why I spoke with Panama's Minister of Security last week, and why, among other engagements in the region, I will be traveling to Central America in the coming weeks, as I have throughout the past three years. You went to Mexico to beg them to do something. You have to beg a friend for help? It's letter Kenny. When a friend asks for help, you help him. Tony Katz, Tony Katz today. Good to be with you. 833-468-8669. 833-GOT-TONY. Find everything at TonyKatz.com. It's an open border. There is no help for Border Patrol. There is no technology for Border Patrol. There is no money for Border Patrol. It is a demoralized Border Patrol. You have more crossings than ever before. Don't sit there and tell us other nations are dealing with this in our hemisphere. Who are you referring to? Name names, show your work. This is a mythology going on from Alejandro Mayorkas, the Homeland Security Secretary. And the mythology continues. In fact... The majority of all migrants encountered at the southwest border throughout this administration have been removed, returned, or expelled, a majority of them. We are doing everything we can within a broken system to incentivize non-citizens to use lawful pathways to impose consequences on those who do not. That is just a fraud. The idea that you expel most of them. Doesn't that indicate to you that the problem is greater than you're explaining? If you have Border Patrol involved in over 300,000 apprehensions in December which was nearly 100,000 more than the December before, nearly 100,000 more than the December before, nearly 100,000 more than the December before. Doesn't that indicate to you that there is a draw taking place that maybe if you stopped it, you would have a chance to catch up instead of having areas, whether it be in Lukeville, Arizona, or others, where Border Patrol is outnumbered 200 to 1. Maybe if we looked at full disruption of the cartel trafficking industry, which, according to Speaker Mike Johnson just last week, is $32 million a week. No, is that a day? No, it was a week. Maybe, just maybe, you could have this under control. Now, no one ever talks about cartel disruption. What you'll hear is destroy the cartels. For the record, that's easier said than done. Oh, I'm not saying it can't be done. I believe that Mexico is not a good partner. I believe that Mexico is not a good neighbor. And I believe that action has to be taken to ensure their help or we have to take action to provide our own help. Our job is to get abused at the southern border. How about we just move the border into Mexico by three and a half miles and we leave it as three and a half miles of quite literally no man's land. Now, I haven't gone so far as to say engage the same way that North Korea and South Korea do. I'm not an animal. But why in the world do we wait till people are on American soil? Why not be proactive? This is where Mexico should be coming in as a neighbor to prevent people from traveling up, but they don't.
Now, admittedly, the meeting that Mayorkas and Blinken, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, had with the Mexican President AMLO, Andres Manuel Ob- Lopez Obrador, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, A-M-L-O, AMLO, that did at least stop trains. Because trains were coming in. Thousands of people on the trains. You had to go ask them to stop? Why were they allowing it to begin with? Serious pressure has to be put on Mexico because this is not how a friend acts. You have a choke point at the south of Mexico as it touches Central America. Maybe you actually have to choke. You just have to say no. It has to stop. It has to be fortified. And then re-fortified. And then re-fortified. Maybe three miles into Mexico, in specific places, we, they, there needs to be an invitation for the United States to be able to act in its best interest. Now, maybe it won't stop everybody, but maybe it'll stop a few. And maybe it'll flow people into areas so we know exactly who is coming into the country. The border is the biggest story in America. The border is the everything. And what do we get for people who are are supposed to be the ones dealing with such a serious situation? We get children... Well, we get frauds like Alejandro Mayorkas, and then we get children like Representative Ocasio-Cortez. From all parts of the political spectrum, one of the biggest issues that we have when it comes to immigration is the fact that we have an undocumented population. Mm -hmm. Now, you can fix that by trying to build a wall, or you can fix that by trying to document people and create a path to citizenship. Mm -hmm. And... um, might say, look at these systems, you know, that our shelter system has weight and things like that. But one of the reasons that our public systems experience weight is because people don't have a documented and reliable path to work and sustain themselves, Mm -hmm. just like all of our ancestors did and our and our grandparents and great grandparents. A child. The only way to get rid of undocumented people or to deal with the undocumented situation is to say, you're now a citizen, here you go. It doesn't matter that you broke the law, we don't care. Here are your services. Milton Friedman, uh, the famed economist, once, um, maybe said it more than once, but he, he theorized that you could have an open border, absolutely open, if you didn't provide any services. If there was no financial incentive or financial aid connected, you could have an open border. Never let it be said that Milton Friedman wasn't wrong about a few things. He was completely wrong uh, about that. Completely wrong about that. Of course, one needs a border. And it needs to be strong. And it needs to remember its job. Protect American citizens. Protect people who are here legally. Protect the people who want to be Americans. One must have a border. And one cannot simply reward the people who do things illegally. But when you're a child, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a child with ignorant, hateful policies like that, you encourage more people to come across. She is encouraging more people to come across. That's what she's doing. We've got an election coming up. I'm going to get into it because uh, I think it's more and more clear that Joe Biden will not be the nominee. So I I will break that down. Um, But there's a couple things happening, including the, the main secretary of state. I don't know if you heard what it is she had to say about Trump being on the ballot. Then there were the Golden Globes. Everyone's talking about the, the Taylor Swift joke that fell flat. Not enough people talking about the Jim Gaffigan comment that is worthy 
of your attention. I have got all of that coming up. This is Tony Katz today. So we should be clear about a couple things. And one of those things is, is that whether you like Trump or don't like Trump, the efforts to keep him off the ballot are dangerous. And if we're going to now be the people who are worried about the threat against democracy, well then... That should lead people to be opposed to these states where they believe, willy-nilly, they can just take Trump off the ballot. How dare he, the starter of a insurrection, as, as they'll say, which of course they're wrong about, how dare he be on the ballot? Now you understand, because we've engaged this before, this has really very little to do with, with, with Trump. This is really an attack on you. This is an attack on you, the voter. Tony Katz. Tony Katz today, 833-468-8669, Got Tony. If you're one of these people who believes that the Secretary of State's, the Secretaries of State across the country should remove Trump from the ballot, it, it, show, your, show your work, explain your math, give me a call. 833-GOT-TONY, 833 833-GOT-TONY, 833- Four six eight eight six six nine. The idea that they're protecting democracy is mythology. And this is very important in the wake of Joe Biden's speech the other day, because he is running on this this pseudo intellectualism of protecting democracy. You have we we have to protect democracy. If we, if we vote improperly, my gosh, the damage that we will be doing. The fear mongering is is quite incredible, but it's everywhere. It is absolutely everywhere that Joe Biden's uh, conversation from the other day, and this is of course permeated. All the talking heads, everywhere you go, everywhere you go. Like, there is stuff that that Biden said that I'm pretty sure I can't play on air because he almost called President Trump a sick blank. And he had to stop himself. And people applauded. Uh, they, 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 they 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 were cheering about it. The threat to democracy, remember we're not a democracy, but neither here nor there, is telling you that you should not be able to have a say. That's where these people are. And they're very, very open about it. This was MSNBC, because all ridiculous things emanate from MSNBC. Fernand Amandi, political analyst, being asked the question. Fernand, one of the questions I had watching President Biden's speech, which was clear, it was impassioned, it set the stakes, is where his campaign then goes from here, how they continue to beat that drum while simultaneously articulating the accomplishments of this administration. You know, Alicia, I don't think that's a difficult um, shoe to fit because to keep the accomplishments economically from all of the progress from a civil rights perspective, it only functions in a democracy. That is why this framing, which I believe is a bulletproof framing, by the way, of making the election a referendum on democracy and the continuation of American democracy or moving to totalitarianism. That is why you hear and see, as you just played a few moments ago, the Trump campaign has made their strategic decision to talk about this and try and weirdly, awkwardly, ridiculously cast Joe Biden as the anti-democratic candidate. How do I also know this? Because I'm seeing this in polling as well. As we now poll voters, this issue of protecting American democracy is rising to the forefront. Good. And let us note how Democrats are not protecting democracy. They are aggressive in its destruction because they support the idea of the secretaries of state 
de facto deciding that people can't be on the ballot. It's Trump today. But if you can get away with screaming, defending democracy, what can't you do? We have to protect democracy. So sorry, talk radio hosts, you're not allowed. We have to protect democracy. So sorry, these books, you're not allowed to be on the shelves. Sorry, you're not allowed to have this website. Sorry, you're not allowed to make that movie. We have to protect democracy. Protecting democracy comes from allowing people to actually engage in it. That's democracy. That's how one keeps the republic. What the political left is doing is the opposite of this. You have, I think you pronounce her name, Sheena Bellows. She's the Secretary of State in Maine. She's on uh, MSNBC with Jen Psaki. Dear Lord. Jen Psaki is is paid Democratic uh, talking point from beginning to end. Don't ever tell me about Hannity or anybody else. This is nuts. The Secretary of State in Maine took Trump off the ballot. Listen, Psaki first and then Secretary Bellows. And it sounds like there's a range of scenarios that the Supreme Court could rule. They could rule in a ruling that includes Maine. They could rule one that doesn't include Maine. You're planning for different scenarios. Trump is on the ballot. Obviously, though, if they rule in a way that kicks him off the ballot, there would be an adjustment, I assume. Of course. A hundred percent. Yes. We will follow the law in the Constitution no matter what. And that was what was so important. So I made my decision based exclusively on the record in the hearing, the weight of the evidence and the arguments were made. I follow the law and the Constitution, as is my duty. Uh, And that's what election officials do every day across this country. This was not your duty. Take someone off the ballot who has neither been charged nor convicted with insurrection, not your duty. First, let me say, you look on TV like you're smiling. Secondly, you don't sound to me like a serious person, but it could be how I hear you. But let's get to the meat of the matter. This is not not why you were elected. You are protecting no one. You are engaged in an ideological political pursuit, and you are keeping the people of Maine from being able to make a decision. This is true in Colorado. The Colorado case going to the Supreme Court, as we know, because they took Trump off the ballot. They're going to argue that they have uh, rationale to under the 14th Amendment. Individual states can make a decision to take a guy off the ballot because they decided he engaged in insurrection? Is that right? Well, if it's just about deciding... I guess Joe Biden's off the ballot. Now, it won't matter because Joe Biden won't be the nominee. Foreshadowing, I'll get to that later. But this is the argument. Well, if they could just kick Trump off, why can't we find a secretary of state from a Republican state, kick Joe Biden off the ballot? Goodbye. What are they going to do? You started a fight, guys. Now, I don't actually want this. Because I believe it's wrong, and I don't think you do the wrong thing to prove that someone's wrong. But the argument counter to that is, how else will these lowlifes learn? They want to take away people's right to vote. They want to make the claim that they know what's best, they know what's scary, and they're going to keep the scary from you, so you don't even get a right to say whether or not you would vote for this person. As undemocratic as the day is long is the political left on this subject. Completely undemocratic. No caring about the law. No caring about the rights of people. So let's stop with the idea that they are protecting democracy when they are the ones most opposed to it. As I said about Colorado then, and I'll say it now, this should already have been taken up. The decision should be 9-0. Trump should be on the ballot. There should be consequences for what, what took place in Colorado. Consequences for Secretary Bellows here in Maine. 
She's a child. Or at least she's acting like a child. Consequences for these progressives who don't believe in your rights. Remember this. Every time you see them scream about threat to democracy, that is them trying to get license to affect the way you engage. Because once you say that a candidate is a threat to democracy, every candidate can be a threat to democracy. Every candidate you decide, every candidate has engaged in a way you find unacceptable. Well, clearly their posts on social media were uh, moving towards insurrection. So we had to do something about this. Once you can remove a candidate from the ballot because you don't like them, you can remove them for anything. And all of a sudden, thought crime becomes a punishable offense through this action. No one who favors democracy, no one who favors democracy, I'll utilize their words, favors removing people from the ballot. No one. And so the people who push for this On MSNBC, these people don't favor democracy. They're authoritarians. They want to hurt you. They want to damage you. Of course. It's not even a question. It is where the evidence takes you. If one is clear, if one is honest... If one recognizes that there's a difference between their ideology and reality, the idea that you would remove people from the ballot because you think they did something, as opposed to whether or not they were adjudicated guilty of something, that is the bigger threat. That is the threat to the survival of a free nation. That threat in today's America comes from the political left. So when you tell me, as I often do, discuss this, there's no difference between the two parties? Maybe there's a difference. I'm Tony Katz. So the trend now is to get a thermal cup from Stanley. The Stanley Pink Valentine Heart 40-ounce tumbler. People are running to Target to get this thing if they haven't already gotten it. And they're now reselling it on eBay for 125 bucks. Tony Katz. Tony Katz today, I don't... What am I supposed to do with the with the thing? It's a... It's 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 a it's a it's a tumbler. It's a you 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 put the you put the drinks in it and, you, and then you drink it and then you're like, ah, oh, that's delicious. And people are now dem- like like in a rush for them. Wasn't it Hydro Flask just a few uh, few years ago? I don't know. I don't know how Stanley figured this one out. But there's video of people actually running in a Target store to get this pink tumbler. I mean, it's like it's like a Yeti. It, it, it's exactly what it is. It's 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 like a Yeti. I, it is weird how things connect and 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 move people. I, I did look for it online. I couldn't find it. Ab- absolutely, positively. Could could not could not find it. Uh, I don't see it at Target, or I don't see it at, at other places. So I, I guess it's already sold out. I guess I guess you've you've already lost out, and you're you're not going to get it. And then you're not going to have your Valentine. And then you're going to live your life alone, and and you're going to die alone. And and that's the way it is. And no one's going to find the body for at least six to twelve years. Is that not how it works? Because I I was told that's how it works. The whole concept of viral, and what gets attention and how things connect is so is so nutty and it it is the most important thing for uh people who are depending on that uh to to note 
There are some things and some people who go viral. Sometimes for the reason of how revealing the, uh, uh, the amount of clothing they're wearing is. Some people for how ridiculous they are. The, the, the more and more maddening things you have to do for attention. We are very much living in a they shoot horses, don't they kind of moment. But the vast majority of people don't go viral. The vast majority of people don't create celebrity on Vine, move that over to YouTube, and then are able to create uh, a water company, a hydration company, that does over a billion dollars in sales like Logan Paul. That, that's, that's, I mean, that doesn't happen. You're not creating hundreds of millions of views like Mr. Beast. I'm not saying that you can't. I'm not even saying that you shouldn't try. I, I think that it just has to be recognized that that's just really, really rare. And just in the same way that you can't depend on getting into the NBA, right? That's it. You got to have a backup plan. How things go viral. A Stanley, does Stanley understand what happened here? All they got to know is they got people showing up at their website left and right trying to buy their stuff. It's got to be good for them, create some opportunities, certainly a lot of free press. That's great. When people were doing the ice bucket challenge, you remember that from a few years? Why, why that charity? You know how many people tried to figure out how to make their charity that? I think it was for ALS, right? Wasn't the ice bucket challenge for, uh, uh, yes, for ALS. There's no understanding it. I don't know why this drink. But if you have one, uh, congratulations. Looks pretty. Hopefully keeps your drink cold or hot. Remember, that's what you're trying to do here. But don't get into a fight over it uh, uh, at a Target. That's just weird. This is Tony Katz today. So, uh, yeah, Michelle Obama is running for president. No, God! What's the problem here? No, God, please, no! Oh, look, no. I, I, hello. No! You just wait one second. No! I'm just saying that it's, well, it's really, 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 really possible. I mean, super stupid possible. Like, cuckoo crazy possible. Why would we somehow think that she's not? How is it possible that anybody thinks that Michelle Obama is not in the mix? Tony Katz, Tony Katz today. 833-468-8669-833. Got Tony. Good to be with you. Uh, look, her words, not mine. The things that yeah. keep me up because you, you don't have control over them. Mm -hmm. And you wonder... Where are people, where are we in this? You know, where are our hearts? What's going to happen in this next election? I am terrified about what could possibly happen because our leaders matter. Who we select, who speaks for us, who holds that bully pulpit. It affects us in ways that I, sometimes I think people take for granted. So you're terrified that Joe Biden's going to lose. And you're sending out the word that you're terrified that Joe Biden is going to lose. Oh, who will save the Democrats from themselves? Enter Michelle Obama. Now, I'm with you. I'm with you. She doesn't want it. She's never acted like a person who wants it. She has never shown a, a desire, uh, a, a, a want for being an elected official. Ever, ever, ever. Never has shown it. But things change and people change and opportunity changes. And clearly Barack Obama wants to keep running that party. So, you know, you do what you got to do. Because isn't that exactly what we're talking about? Isn't exactly what we're talking about. About how... The, the, the power structure stays in power. And you say to me, Tony, you're not one of these people who believes that Barack Obama is really running the show. 
uh, may I say, with all due respect, uh, do you believe that Joe Biden is actually running the show? So if it's not Barack Obama, it's somebody else, it's some group of people, an amalgam of people, whatever the case may be. You can't run Joe Biden again. So what do you do? Now let's start, let's let's take a, a, a look back and, and ask ourselves if, if that's still the case. You can't run Joe Biden again. Joe Biden is unpopular and Joe Biden is a doddering old man. He is what he is. And I don't care if someone calls me ageist. Damn straight I'm an ageist. Some people are too old for the thing. That's all there is to it. My father, who is not uh, as strong as he was 10 years ago at the age of 85, is more lucid than Joe Biden and would be a better president than Joe Biden. I don't think my father should run for president. I just, I just don't think that would be the best move for the country. Joe Biden is old. And Joe Biden is incapable. And Joe Biden has whatever mental issues he has. I'm not here to diagnose the man. I am here to say, yeah, that's not right. And you know it, and I know it, and they know it. So they're going to replace him. It's going to happen at the convention. They're going to replace him on the ballot. Now, of course I could be wrong. And he doesn't get replaced. I would say the odds are heavily in the favor of replacing him. Now, the question is, with whom? I have just laid out for you the incontrovertible facts that he is unpopular with America, he is unpopular with the party, he is seen as old, he is seen as incapable, no one views this economy as great except for Paul Krugman, and Paul Krugman is a remarkable fool Why in the world would it not be Michelle Obama? How much more clear does it need to be? Under Section 37B of the contract, it states quite clearly that all offers shall become null and void if, and you can read it for yourself in this photostatic copy, I, the undersigned, shall forfeit all rights, privileges, and licenses, hearing and hearing contained, etc., etc., fax mentis incendium gloria calpum, etc., etc., Memo bis punitor delicatum. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. I like to bring in my lawyer, Willy Wonka, from time to time to explain these things. Why shouldn't it be Michelle Obama? Or or it, it could be somebody else. But this is happening. And and I think that the the only smart thing to do is to be fully prepared for it. Fully prepared prepared for it because it's coming and it could be somebody as well known as Michelle Obama or it could be somebody from far afield what will matter most is that when that person is announced all Democrats all Democrats on cue will all have the same reaction yes 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 They will be the greatest person who ever lived. And if you bring up Joe Biden, they'll go, why are you bringing that up? Look who we're running. This is so great. If you bring up Joe Biden, nobody's talking about Joe Biden. Look at this person. They're the greatest person in the world. That's what's going to happen. That's how it's going to go down. But it isn't the only thing going on. The election is heating up. As we get uh, close to, uh, to, to the caucus next week, and we now have the endorsement that matters, the endorsement of Nikki Haley by Judge Judy. Can we just note that it's 2024? Why shouldn't these things happen? Why shouldn't Judge Judy be engaged in endorsements? Quote, I truly think she can restore America. I'm proud to endorse Nikki Haley because she is whip smart. 
has executive credentials, and was a superb governor. Is that right? Haley said that Judge Scheinlin, Judy Scheinlin, quote, has earned the respect of millions of Americans from her courtroom by being thoughtful, fair, and honest. No, she has millions of viewers because she yells at stupid people and they're not allowed to yell back. That's why people like Judge Judy. Because she's fair? No, because she calls somebody a dum-dum and she wears a robe and they can't say anything, otherwise they lose money. I'm sorry, I didn't know we I didn't know we weren't having an honest conversation. I, I would have thought that was I would have thought that was pretty dang important. Um it, it, it's 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 already a train wreck, right? It's already just ridiculous. Now, do I call my shot? Is this what I'm supposed to do? Am I supposed to call my shot right now? Because if if I look at data, it's it's not Iowa, it's New Hampshire. That's kind of amazing. You want the last New Hampshire poll? CNN, Trump 39, Haley 32, Christie 12, DeSantis 5. Ramaswamy at 8%. So right now, the real clear politics average has Trump 43, Haley 29. Dude, that CNN poll is all anybody's talking about. Because what they're saying is, why the hell is Chris Christie still in this race? Get out of the race. Every Christie supporter is a Haley supporter. Haley wins New Hampshire, and now it happens. What are you doing, Chris Christie? Don't you know you should already be announcing for Senate and take out Bob Menendez? You'd get help. People would help you do it. Look, uh, you you hugged Barack Obama after Superstorm Sandy uh, there in New Jersey, which was brutal, by the way. And that was a wrong thing to do. Wrong thing to do. Could have just shook the man's hand. You went for the hug. Sorry, you got to deal with that. You've got Bridgegate things. You've got some pettiness involved. You got you on the beach, etc. Dude, people would totally be with you. They'd totally be with you. They would do it. And you'd give Haley the opportunity to win New Hampshire if indeed this polling is right. This, as we were talking about, this is much different than looking at Iowa. You cannot compare the two things. In the last poll, which is the morning consult poll, Trump 58, Haley 15, DeSantis 14. And right now Haley has overtaken DeSantis. Now I'm going to say a couple of things that may be met with shock. Number one, I don't know if I believe it. I have people on the ground in Iowa who tell me she absolutely is going to dominate in the metros, and there's no doubt that DeSantis needs the rural areas to pull him through. Uh, that, 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 I think that's accurate. I keep having this nagging feeling that DeSantis is going to pull things out in, in in Iowa because I think the cold is going to benefit him. This is nothing more than a feeling. There is no data to back up what I just said. I have, from the beginning, said I'm looking at the numbers, I see the polling numbers, I see how ahead Trump is, I, I I have trouble buying it. I have trouble buying it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait for January 15th. I'm going to wait for the Iowa caucus. Take a look at the Iowa caucus. On the day of the caucus, which is Monday, January 15th, the high temperature is negative three. The low is negative 14. I spoke about this uh, on my morning show. It was negative 12. The temperature is going down as we talk. Who shows up to a caucus? This isn't a primary where you, you, you walk in, you vote, you walk out. 
You got to be there in in the auditorium. You got to be there in someone's living room. And you got to drive there in 12 degrees below zero temperatures. I don't know if people come out. I have no idea if people come out or not for this. What I know is that it can have an effect on the night of the caucus. I have stated that I don't believe that the polling numbers translate to the activist on the ground for Trump. I could easily be wrong about this. Again, it's just a feeling. That's all it is. And the reason that I bring it up in this way is that people are out there telling you exactly what's going to happen. Guys, they don't know crap. They have their own beliefs and they're putting it out there as fact. Beliefs are not fact. No one knows. And no one can really uh, make sense of where this weather, how this weather is going to treat things. This is why I think that the cold favors DeSantis. Because DeSantis is down in the polls, because DeSantis has not had the great campaign, I don't care what anybody says. They want to tell you, oh, that's just Trump talk uh, about, no, it's not. He hasn't had a good campaign. Stop it. It's okay to say. People find their legs when they find their legs. If you don't remember John McCain, it wasn't until South Carolina that he came on. He was out. It was Iowa, New Hampshire, and he was out. It was devastation. He was destroyed. Destroyed. But he didn't, he didn't freak out. He didn't lose his mind. Be cool, honey bunny. Be cool. And the rest is history. He gets the nomination and then loses to Barack Obama. If I am accurate in the DeSantis supporter, realizing that the campaign has gone, but they are still believers, well then, why wouldn't they be believers on that night? They are already believers. I think I almost said believers, but that's Justin Bieber. That's something different. Uh, they're already believers when the polling is against them. Why wouldn't they be believers even in 12 degree below temperatures? The Trump people think he's just going to take it. I don't need to show up. The, the Haley people like ascendancy don't need to show up. This is why I say it. I want to share with you where I'm at. I want you to know. I'm putting my marker down. I think DeSantis can, I think he will overperform. Can I think the possibilities are, I'm trying to hedge the bet. No, I think he's going to overperform. The problem is, shouldn't winning be exactly where he's at? Haley's surge in the numbers is real. Can't be denied. Cannot be denied. But I think that when it comes to to, to the caucus, the people who are the actual believers, the ones who show up, man, I think that gives the edge. I think that gives the edge to Ron DeSantis. Now, you might say to me, Tony, you're a DeSantis guy. It's just wishful thinking. Oh, heck, we're all going to find out on Monday. Just grab the bourbon and let's go to work. But there's there's an interesting, I think you got to admit that, that I, I'm, I'm, I'm offering up a, certainly an idea that that has possibility about the idea of where the polling is and where the believers are. That said, there's another thing to consider in this caucus conversation. When it's negative 12 and the turnout is crap, does it matter who won? New Hampshire won't care. And the people who came in second and third won't care. Well, it was so cold in New Hampshire and our people and this and that and the areas. New Hampshire's where we're going to do great. That's the killer. I mean, here I am saying that there's this opportunity, but the killer is it's so easy to dismiss when it, the temperatures are, are, are like this and you can blame the weather. You can easily dismiss it and everybody will buy in. Everybody will buy in. So, am I to the place where why am I paying attention to, to Iowa? I should be paying attention to New Hampshire? If that's the case, I shouldn't pay attention to New Hampshire. I should only pay attention to South Carolina. 
And if, if South Carolina is in some way muddled, we're on to Super Tuesday. I'm not saying it will happen like this. I'm saying that it could get interesting all because it's cold. Oh, by the way, the Judge Judy endorsement. Doesn't move anybody. Just so you know. I'm Tony. It was a statement that was made by the Indiana Democratic Party. And I want to make sure that I am clear about something I have been clear about. I want to make sure I say it again. There are individual Democrats in the General Assembly who I thought have engaged rational conversations and have had some interesting ideas. It's not that I always agree with them, but I always appreciate a rational conversation. There are people like Ed Delaney out of Indianapolis who I think are unserious as of late in engaging in rational conversation, although I've spoken to the man before. Then there are people like Carrie Hamilton. Now, I'm not saying I would agree with Carrie Hamilton on everything. But she, this is a couple years ago, well, last year, this was last year because we had the special session. She's the one who wanted to eliminate the tax on diapers. That's a damn good idea. I don't care who you are. That's a good idea. You've got new moms, new parents. Why make their life more difficult? Make it a little bit easier. And so if you're taking it from that side, uh, I'm cool with that. If you take it from, let's say, my conservative side, less taxes are always better. This got put forth in the regular session and it never went anywhere because Republicans didn't let it go anywhere. And I said, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. Republicans should have been all over this. Carrie Hamilton, this is the best idea in the world. This is fantastic on terrific on wonderful this is great absolutely let's do this and hey here's 12 more things we should get rid of taxes on to make it easier for hoosier families let's go bipartisan we not a single vote against let's get this done we will have a signing celebration like you have never seen before it we're gonna have balloon animals it's gonna be terrific that didn't happen as a matter of fact what happened is it got stalled Right, it never moved forward. And then in the special session, that's when this idea got through. I think this was a mistake from the Republican Party. You didn't want to give her credit? That's that's the wrong thing. The right way to handle this politically is to say, my gosh, Carrie Hamilton, good on you. A Democrat who understands the importance of reducing taxes on working Hoosier families Thank you, thank you, thank you. We cannot wait to work with you on a dozen other subjects. Really, thank you for bucking so many in your party and recognizing that who's your families come first. Now I ask you guys, why couldn't the Republican Party of Indiana do that? Why why not? By the way, I I wouldn't even need to be that political. Like, if I was governor and I saw that, I'd be like, we're doing that. Get it done. Something you don't see from from, from, from Governor Holcomb. At, at all, by the way. Not, not, not just not enough. At all. So, that was always maddening to me. That just give her the do and get it done. And then you can engage a little bit of spin, you know, just the way I, I, I did it. So when I saw this statement from the Indiana Democratic Party, it once again reminded me that there's a massive difference between the people who are in office and the party apparatchik. The party apparatchik, Mike Schmuel, uh, Sam Barloga, these people who, who, who run the party, they're the most virulent leftists there are. Uh, Oh my gosh, today we remember January 6th and the horrific insurrection led by President Trump. Never been charged, never convicted because you say it doesn't make it real. It's an absolute lie and a fraud against the American people and the Indiana Democratic Party doesn't care. It's gross. 
You don't have to be gross. We don't have to be the rest of the country. We don't have to be MSNBC, Indiana Democratic Party. Could you just focus on Hoosiers and stop being jerks? It's madness. Drives me nuts. But they put out a statement on the House Democratic agenda. And in the agenda, they say House Democrats' economic freedom agenda includes policies that benefit Hoosier workers, such as raising the statewide minimum wage to $15 an hour and making union dues tax deductible. And I stopped cold. I said, I don't understand what I'm reading here. I have no idea where this comes from. How is economic freedom agenda first things first you're 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 you're, you're taking uh from the uh from the political right right there just so we're all uh clear you're taking from the when you talk about economic freedom you're 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 taking from the political right then i read a little bit more and the story w- was over there uh, at wibc.com Again, with the headline, Democrats propose economic freedom for Hoosiers in legislative agenda. And it was a quote from Phil Giaquinta, who is the House Minority Leader there in the General Assembly. And he he, the statement is, quote, when I look around the communities across Indiana, I don't see freedom. If we are honest with ourselves, we must admit most Hoosiers can't get ahead. In fact, the numbers tell us that most Hoosiers are fighting to stay afloat financially. They aren't able to save. And and so it continues with, let's deal with the ballooning property tax bills looming over homeowners' heads, and let's give them a homestead credit funded by state surplus dollars. Let's address housing and utility costs by cracking down on corporate greed. Let's also increase the renter deduction. With this, I said, I have some questions. And I immediately got uh, my, my producer, one of my producers, Carl, to, to reach out. And we, we've heard a response, and we're going to make this happen, a conversation. And I said then, what I, what I say now, what I want to have a conversation about. One of the things that seemingly Phil Giaquinta and House Democrats want to do with their economic freedom agenda is raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Now, I have a lot of questions about the renter deduction. I have a serious question about what's meant by cracking down on corporate greed. Let's address housing and utility costs by cracking down on corporate greed. I don't actually know what that means. Let's give people a homestead credited by the state surplus dollars because of property tax bills. Well, that's interesting. Let's see how that would work. What are the pluses? What are the minuses? Because all of us across the state are dealing with with this property tax issue and it has not been fun. Is this a workable plan? Let us discuss that as we should. Economic freedom is raising the minimum wage. Now, I'm, I'm letting people know my hand as I have this conversation because when we do speak, uh, with with the minority leader, Phil Giaquinta, this is going to come up. I would like an explanation of how that works. Economic freedom is $15 an hour. With all due respect, wouldn't economic freedom be $5,000 an hour? I mean, if, if, if we're having a conversation about what it would mean to not have any worries, is that what we mean by freedom, though? What is meant by economic freedom? Because it would seem to me to be a statement at odds with the policy prescription. Economic freedom does not, or cannot, I should say, entail telling employers they have to pay X. How is that freedom? Uh, I mean, this is the question that I'm going to ask, and I I want this to be uh, a, a worthy philosophical debate. How do you explain to Hoosiers that that's what freedom is when somebody has to pay it and it is not you, the lawmaker? It's the people. It's the business owners. So there is no 
freedom for them to be able to engage in negotiation and to pay what they believe is the proper wage based on market forces, it's being forced upon them. And what happens when in order to stay in business, they not only don't hire, but they fire two more people so they can afford to pay everybody else this wage and give them more work to do? Is that economic freedom? And if you say to me, Tony, that doesn't happen. Well, we would have to now talk to some business owners, wouldn't we? And then we would find out quite quickly, absolutely it happens. How do we think automation in fast food came on with such a rapidness? It's because it's a way of reducing labor costs. You want to talk about ways we've reduced labor costs? How about every time you have an issue with name your a credit card company, a bank, or somebody else, you have to call a system where you only get to speak to a machine. You don't get to talk to people. If you have a problem with Facebook, there is no customer service for you to call. If you had a problem with Google, do you get to talk to anybody? You actually get to talk to a person? You don't get to talk to a person. The, the, these things are done to reduce costs. And it's also done to keep uh, you, the end user, at arm's length and just deal with what they tell you. But it, 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 is, it is clear and obvious that it is done as a cost-reducing measure. I want to know how that brings us economic freedom. Now, other things that uh, uh, the leader, Gia Quinto, wants to do is expand, uh, ex enact and expand access to universal pre-K, um, which uh, he believes would help with, with literacy. Fine conversation, so I'm looking forward uh, to it. But when I saw this economic freedom agenda and then raising the minimum wage, and also, as, as was, was, was stated, the idea, here it is in, the, in their press release, um, that they would want to make union dues tax deductible. I would like to make cigars tax deductible. I'm, I'm a man who smokes cigars. I review cigars. I would like to make bourbon tax deductible. You know what? Rye is Indiana's drink. Let's make rye whiskey tax deductible. Why not? Once we start engaging the conversation of tax deductions, why is it only for this specific purpose? To help out union membership? Uh, allow me to ask the question, a question I will ask. Uh, uh, I certainly hope to get to. Does unionization mean economic freedom? All I'm asking is for an understanding of what it is that's really being said and yeah, to, to, to show your work. Explain it. Explain how that betters the, the, the average or non-average, who's your family? How that makes Indiana a better place. To their credit, they responded quickly. They responded uh, professionally. Um, do you, and then they asked, uh, what day would, would be good, uh, to appear on the show? And we sent some, some, some time, some days and, and, and hope it all comes uh, together. The general assembly session is, is a shorter session, this, this term, but is nonetheless important. And it is true that with less and less local news outlets, there's less and less coverage of what they do, and the coverage is necessary. They have to see that we're watching, and that keeps uh, them on the up and up and really keeps them away from the temptation of saying, how do I get a pork product project for myself and for my town, et cetera, and just spend the people's money? Really important. And I think that we should be having these conversations very out loud and with a bit of decency, with a bit of respect, or a lot of decency and a lot of respect. So hopefully it all come together. And when it does, we'll bring it to you. This is Tony Katz today.
in fact, the majority of all migrants encountered at the southwest border throughout this administration have been removed, returned, or expelled, a majority of them. We are doing everything we can within a broken system to incentivize non-citizens to use lawful pathways, to impose consequences on those who do not, and to reduce irregular migration. That is Secretary Mayorkas, and that's just nonsense. You are not doing everything you can. And you keep saying broken system. We get it. Lots to do on the immigration front. But stop telling us you're doing everything you can. That's simply untrue. Tony Katz. Tony Katz today. Good to be with you. And then to tell the American people this. The high number of migrants we have encountered at our southern border is a challenge that is not unique to the United States. Countries throughout our hemisphere, in fact, throughout the world, are experiencing an unprecedented number of displaced people fleeing poverty, authoritarian regimes, homes destroyed by extreme weather events, corruption, and violence. With all due respect, you have an open sign. And no one cares what's happening in other nations. As a matter of fact, we should learn from other nations not to do this. They're having a hard time in the UK, hard time in Germany, Poland and Hungary, less so. We should be learning lessons. Instead, we give people a slip of paper that says, hey, you don't have to see a judge for another four and a half years. Have a nice day. You're in the country now. I'd put an end to asylum. I'd put an end to it. The NGOs that teach people to lie, I would charge them with treason. And until this border is secure with policy and technology, shut it down. We're not safe. Remember that when you vote. Doesn't matter who the left runs. They can't keep the country safe because they don't want to. Now, all we have to do is force the political right to move forward on policy. Yeah, just that easy. Find everything at TonyCats.com tomorrow, everyone. Take care.